I'm uh, Dr Emma Baxter. I'm a research scientist at SIUC in Edinburgh and I'm in the Animal Behaviour and Welfare team. My talk's about uh, which different freedom farrowing system um, that farmers might want to adopt, um, in both now but also in the future. I think they'll take away different things. They'll uh, take away what the status quo is regarding the, the farrowing crate in different countries. They'll also uh, take away what the market opportunities are, where the research is, but also what different uh, alternatives uh, to the farrowing crate there are out there. And finally, um, hopefully I'll be able to talk to them about optimising performance um, in alternative farrowing systems. Thanks very much, Angela, and thanks very much for inviting me here to talk to you today about uh, freedom farrowing systems, both uh, now but also in the future. And I thought it might be best to start with uh, the status quo regarding the, the farrowing crate and where it's banned in the world. Um, it's only banned totally in three countries um, in Europe. That's uh, Switzerland, Sweden and Norway. It's been banned there since 1997. Obviously, you know the UK industry, we're quite unusual globally, having 40% of the herd completely uh, free farrowing. There are some interesting case studies in both Austria and uh, Denmark, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit more detail, um, both pledging to phase out um, uh, farrowing crates and also to have 10% of the herd uh, free farrowing in Denmark. So there's no EU-wide ban, as you know, the farrowing crates, I don't think there's going to be one on the horizon, but there's certainly momentum um, and industry interest, particularly in Europe, probably because of the highlight on confinement systems in general um, following the gestation stall ban. So if we look at certain countries and, and, and see what has prompted targets for change, uh, the Austrian situation is very interesting. So, Back in um, 2010, there was a, a, a big uh, incident regarding farrowing crates. Um, they were, the farmers were put under a lot of public pressure. And this was because of a legal challenge to their, leg their current legislation on animal welfare. So they do abide by the EU regulations, but they also have animal welfare regulations or codes, and then they have an Animal Welfare Act. And it was actually a law student that found a discrepancy between the two regarding the welfare of the sow. And this prompted a, a massive campaign by, by activists. It got very heated. Um, I'm informed by my Austrian colleagues that it, was, it got quite nasty. Um, it, resulted in, it resulted in a new regulation that crating would be phased out by 2033. And even now, the pens that they have, they have to be a minimum of four to five meters squared with a minimum of a third of the flooring solid. After 2033, all pens must allow the sow to turn around and be a minimum of 5.5 meters squared. So they've put these uh, things in place. Um, they still allow crating. In fact, they don't use the term freedom farrowing at all. They use the term temporary crating. Um, so they're looking to crate uh, for just the critical period. And so there's now a lot of R&D investment into that critical period, which is basically the first five days of life. And there's a project called ProSAO that are testing lots of different temporary crating options. And actually, my, my colleague in, in Austria has lent me a, a few of um, his slides to show you different systems. Denmark are another country that have obviously targeted change. They currently have the EU regulations as well as some specifics about their sows when, they, when you have to move them in, but no crate ban. But in 2014, there was an action plan to improve pig welfare in general, and they pledged that 10% of the national herd would be free farrowing by 2021. So that's actually quite a significant proportion of, their, of, of pigs. So again, there's a large investment in R&D in Denmark. Um, they now have this, this showroom where they are um, exhibiting 10 different temporary crate options. So again, terminology is important here. They're probably looking towards temporary crating in the first instance because of the, the fact that they are showing these different options. But an interesting comment from um, a colleague in Denmark, Vivi Musten, who you might already know. We asked her at a recent free firing workshop uh, what she thought the, the situation was. Um, in Denmark both now and in the future. And she said, well, 10 years ago when I was spoke to farmers, um, they weren't keen at all, nobody was going to invest. Five years ago, some of them will invest. And now, if they're going to rebuild, they're all thinking about it. They're all thinking about a different option. And I think that's quite an, an interesting change in attitude. In terms of what's happening in the UK, well, in terms of the government, the Farm Animal Welfare Committee re um, released their 2015 opinion on free farming system. There were various recommendations, some of them not particularly groundbreaking. We've, we've looked at design before, but they did mention genetics of free farrowing, which I think is um, very important uh, in terms of the research that we're doing now. 
We need the best sow for free farrowing. They talked about litter size controls because that's one of the challenges in all farrowing systems. And then they, uh, thankfully, they highlighted um, management and the need for stock person training, which I think is very important. And they'll review this again in 2020. In terms of where the research is at, as I said, um, I, the reason I didn't think it was particularly groundbreaking to talk about investing more and more in designs is because we've done this for years. There's been free firing research for about 30 plus years. Certainly there needs to be some optimization of some of the specifics, but perhaps a barometer for where the research um, it has, has been uh, progressing in the last 10 years is to look at um, these different workshops that have um, been held. The first one was in Denmark. It only had a few uh, northern European countries involved, and it very much was academic, talking about piglet survival and maternal behaviour. And then in Austria, following their, um, the controver controversy with the farring crate, they hosted an event which included uh, some Eastern European countries, and there they talked about legislation, design, and uh, piglet survival again and maternal behaviour. But more recently, we hosted one um, in 2016, and here we had 14 countries represented, including uh, Spain. We also had uh, academics there, as well as industry, NGOs, retailers, and government. And the focus for this particular um, topic, uh, particular workshop, was very much about uh, moving towards uptake. So what are the barriers, looking at different assurance schemes, and definitely looking at knowledge transfer, and um, as well as, as, again, maternal behavior, and importantly, management. So what are the market opportunities out there? Well, you all probably know very well that the RSPCA Assured and the Soil Association both have specifics um, in, their in their standards about free farrowing. Obviously, the latter is just interested in the outdoor organic production. The majority of RSPCA Assured meat comes from the outdoor, um, the outdoor sector. But they do have, the RSPCA does have um, welfare standards specific to, to indoor free farrowing. And they won't approve any specific system, I should say that, but they certainly will um, audit based on design criteria. And within their regulations, they have stated that none of the equipment um, can have the potential to confine the sow for farrowing. And they also have specific minimum requirements about um, how much space is required for the sow in both the piglets as well as other elements. Um, so they do have um, uh, opportunities, I suppose, for indoor um, free farrowing. What, a, what about out, out with the RSPCA Assured and the Soil Association? Well, we have some other interesting um, uh, uh, labels. Uh, I'll go through a few of them in a minute. Um, there's also a, a sort of awards to try and maybe incentivize uh, uh, retailers. Very few retailers mention specifically free firing in their, in their corporate policies. But I quite like to pull out this particular uh, label. I'm not going to try and pronounce that, but it's from Germany, and it's the Action for Animal Welfare. And here, um, they have a pot of money, and the finances are capped. And then the farmers enter a lottery to be included, if you like, in this cooperative. But the farmers themselves can choose which changes they want to make for varying increases in payments. So for example, if they provide nesting material for the sow, then they can get a, a, a bump up in the euro, a 0.9 of a euro for that. But for free firing, you can get two euros. But the point about this label is the consumer is actually blind to it. So they know there's been an animal welfare improvement. They don't necessarily know at what level. And that's quite an interesting and seems to be reasonably successful um, uh, initiative. <coughs> The Danes have launched their um, Three Hearts campaign very recently, um, looking at um, uh, rewarding farmers for temporary crating until you get to three stars is when you go out, outdoors. And also then the Danish cooperative released their, um, their variations of, of a good indoor life and a good outdoor life and things like that. The point is, is that I think Denmark are trying to push the uptake on by, by offering these market opportunities in order to get that 10% by 2021. So, what are the different systems out there? Well, um, there are actually quite a lot. Um, I won't go into uh, all of them in a huge amount of detail. I, I'll direct you to this website that my colleague Sandra Edwards and I put together um, to try and collate a lot of the information out there on different firing systems. It's, it's directed towards uh, the industry. Um, so if you want more specifics about dimensions and things like that, then that's at this website. I'm not gonna go into that much detail. Um, but I will pull out the, the most, uh, I guess, popular designs out there. And let's start with um, uh, the temporary crating option. So think about some terminology here. This isn't completely free farrowing. 
Um, temporary crating does exactly what it says on the tin. It confines uh, the sow in a crate for usually the first five days. So she's moved in and she's confined and then she's let out usually after about five to seven days. These systems are usually built um, on the same spatial footprint as the crate. Um, some are more generous. They're usually fully slatted. Um, and there are a lot of them out there. So a lot of building companies will offer some form of, of temporary crating, which is perhaps a barometer for the, the momentum in the industry. Um, but perhaps the most famous one, at least in this country, is uh, the 360 for the Midland pig producer. Um, if you're not familiar with it, then it, it is on the same footprint as a farring crate, but then the sides of the crate um, sort of bend backwards and they allow the sow then to be able to turn around um, uh, during lactation. So this is it um, in the closed position here in a, in a Finrone uh, porter pig, if you like, and uh, this is it in its open position. I was asked to provide sort of a pros and cons uh, column for all the systems I'm going to discuss, and I will do that, but with a few caveats that um, I can't uh, tell you anything other than what I see. So if a farmer chooses to add additional things to the system they have, such as nesting material, um, for the sow, then um, that they can do that. But I can only um, comment on, I guess, the design, design dimensions that are there. I also can't weight any of the attributes. And by that, I can't, I'm not going to say uh, a positive for the sow is more important than a positive for the farmer and, and so forth. So just bear those things in mind as I go through the various pros and cons. Certainly for the 360, um, the pro is it is on the same footprint as uh, the crate, so there will be implications for the farmer for cost and uh, presumably labour. And a really important thing, which I think is often overlooked, is, is for um, people that work in crates, this wouldn't be a massive a change in mindset for them if they wanted to go for temporary crating. Um, for the sow, she is obviously going to be loose for lactation. You're not going to put this system in and then just keep her in. That would be um, completely pointless. For the piglets, when it's closed in its crate position, then obviously it offers similar protection to just a conventional firing crate. Um, but when it's open, there is easier other access um, during lactation. And we know from, from a lot of um, papers out there that when the sow is loose, when she's suckling, she lets down for longer, and then that can have an impact um, potentially on piglet weights. We also know that when she's loose for lactation, she usually eats a bit more and she weans in a, in a better condition. In terms of the, the potentially more, more negative things, I, I will say that actually I think the same footprint as a crate is potentially uh, a negative for the farmer because of our current genetics and the way the genetics are going in terms of large litter size. We know the biometrics of litters, we know how much space they take up, 14 piglets in a pen all the way up to 28 days. And we know that uh, you know, previously that space was designed for a low, smaller litter size and a lower weaning age. So I, I think possibly it's a bit short-sighted to just replace like for like. Um, in the design I see there, it might be difficult to access the piglets when she is loose because there's no dedicated creep area. The sows are confined for nest building and farrowing unless the farmer chooses to have it open all the time, but I'll come back to that. I'm not sure that is a good idea in terms of performance. Because it's a fully slatted system, there are limitations for the substrate that you can provide her for nest building. And there's limited space to perform what I would um, call good maternal behaviours. So there's a certain amount of space that a sow will use to lie down carefully. There's a certain amount of space we know the sow will use to what we call group piglets. And this is the sort of behaviour she does before she lies down. And there is some evidence coming out of the Switzerland that they suggest that's five metres squared, although I think the jury is out on that um, particular data set. I think they still need to look into that. For the piglets, there's limited space and opportunities for an enriched environment. I'll go into the benefits of an enriched environment um, later on. And at least in this system, there is no dedicated creep area. And I, I really think that a dedicated creep area is an important um, uh, part of loose farrowing. Um, and when the crate is open, of course, there will be a, a limited amount of protection. So there are other um, systems out there that possibly offer a bigger footprint. There's this wing pen system. Um, it, it's, uh, the footprint is 5.5 metres squared. I suggest that that's just really for the piglets because you can see that when it opens up, there's really the sow can only back in and out. I, I don't actually think this system allows full turning. So it, yeah, it's, it's potentially not one that you would uh, do if you wanted the sow to completely turn round. Uh, the Big Dutchman offer a, a temporary crate option with a larger space um, here when it's open. So the 
pros and cons here is the similar pros and cons to the 360, um, but certainly having a larger footprint will accommodate a larger litter all the way up to 28 days. The problems that I'm getting back from people that are working in the system is that once these, um, uh, the crate is open, there's a lot more metal left in the pen where the fixations were um, to keep it closed. And that can be quite a high injury risk area for the piglets. Um, so some of the feedback is that piglets are getting crushed up against those, those fixings. So there's some optimization to be done there. And as I said, I don't think the sow can turn around in this space looking at the, body di the, the dimensions. Jetwash and Vissing Agro also um, have uh, options as well. They've uh, accommodated a few extra things here. I do like the, the creep area. I like the fact that when the sow is enclosed, uh, the creep for the Vissing Agro is this corner creep. And when they're suckling, they also can um, feel the heat from the creep. And we suggest that the corner creeps are quite good to get them to learn, um, learn to use it. And uh, when it's open, it's quite a large space for the sow. Um, and it's very easy access from the passageway, which is always uh, a very good point for the, for the farmers. The biggest of the temporary crate options is the prodromi. Um, this is designed by the Netherlands. They focus very much on large litters, having to get, get high creep intake. Um, and you can see that they have very big creep here. This is called the, um, the nanny. Um, and uh, yeah, they've invested heavily in that. But what I would say about all of these temporary crate options is they've designed to be temporary crate options. So if you put them in and then think about having the sows completely loose, you have to think about whether that's fit for purpose. Um, the only system that actually has thought about starting with a pen and then adding a crate is the swap, which was uh, designed in Denmark. So it has solid flooring. The idea is that you put the sow in and then la allow her to be out for nest building and farrowing. Um, they have slope walls, which we know the sows prefer to lie down against. Um, so there, there are bonuses there. The only thing is there are some quite um, specific um, management routines when you do need to shut the sow in. If we move into truly free farrowing systems, um, then we look at zero confinement. And these are what we call the designed pens. And these are a larger space. Usually there are zoned areas to accommodate different biological needs. And usually there is a, a fair amount of solid flooring in there. I'll start with the biggest one, which I'm most familiar with. Um, the pig safe system can occupy a footprint as large as um, almost nine meters squared, but it can also be smaller than that, particularly if you ret retrofit. And it has different areas to fulfill different criteria. So there's a lot of work gone into the design of the nest. But they also have this separate um, lockable feeding area um, so that the stock person can get in and deal with the piglets um, with the sow uh, locked away. Um, so the reason it's so big is it's trying to accommodate lots of different needs of all the stakeholders, so the, um, the farmer, the piglets, and the sow. So with that in mind, there are going to be a lot of pros to this system because it's been thought about in that respect. So we have the potential for safe working. Um, obviously, the sow is loose, so we can provide her with nest building substrate, and we know that that is um, a bonus uh, for the sows. When you allow them to nest build, it usually improves farrowing progression, but there's also some work now showing that there's increased um, oxytocin levels and increased IgG in the colostrum. Uh, if she has a separate dunging area, then there's better, there's better um, hygiene as well. For the piglets, easier other access throughout, a large accessible creep, and also a dynamic neonatal environment. And we now know that there's quite a lot of work showing the benefits of that long time. So there's some really nice work um, from the Dutch showing that there are some health benefits uh, from providing uh, piglets with an enriched neonatal environment. In terms of the cons, obviously one of the very big cons, although I said I wasn't going to wait it, is that this large space is going to cost more. Um, and there might also be implications for labor, although we haven't necessarily um, found those yet. And for the farmer, it's a very different mindset to the crate. So again, that's, that's a hurdle to overcome. And the piglets, the protection is very much based on maternal behavior. Um, other design pens out there, this is the Sour Comfort Pen in Norway. Um, they don't believe in using a creep, so I would say that's a disadvantage. They, they look at um, uh, temperature profiles to try and direct the piglets to be in one area and the sow in the other, but it is tricky to separate them. And then there's the, um, the, the Wellcon, which is the Austrian organic version uh, uh, of a designed pen. Um, in uh, Switzerland, they've been working with this fat system for a long time. You can go and look at these uh, sows live now if you want to. Um, and the Danes have worked with this free farrow, and they're the systems that have been being used in, in Sweden. 
Group systems have become, uh, have sort of reinvented themselves. Um, this is where you start off in maybe a design pen and then multi-suckle after about 10 days. The Dutch are also looking at this, as well as the Germans, except for they will create, they, um, for their human health and safety, they, they say that they will temporarily create, so there's no full free firing there. The reason that these have come back into fashion, well, we heard a lot about um, things like gut health and antimicrobial resistance, and I think this is trying to push the weaning age back. So there's potential to completely remove the weaner facility in growing in the, in the group situation, but only if you do lactational estrus. So it's quite a, a big undertaking. So this is when you uh, essentially get the sows pregnant whilst they're still with their current litter by managing lactational estrus. There are advent advantages to um, group systems, obviously for the sow, she could be mixed and that were before um, weaning, so it would reduce aggression in the long term. And there are significant advantages for the piglets. We see increased growth rates. You almost eliminate the weaning growth check and therefore um, this might have implications in the long run for antibiotic usage. So I think that's why the Dutch in particular are looking at this again. But it is incredibly sensitive to management, especially lactational estrus. The uh, Australian colleagues are, are using, potentially using pharmaceuticals to try and get this to work, but I don't think we necessarily want to replace, uh, to, to use pharmaceuticals rather than natural behaviour, because that's another um, uh, thing that the public might not be particularly happy with. And the groups is a very different mindset. There's potential for cross-suckling, not only to be disruptive for the sow, but also for individuals. So the decisions that you have to make is what do you want to focus on? Do you want to focus on uh, stock person input? Therefore, you might want a system that's got more control. Do you want to focus on sow input? Therefore, you might want to put a system in that tries to get the sow to do the work for you or both. Is it cost? Is it the standards that you're trying to meet to get a price premium? But importantly, will your system be future-proof? So is it future-proofed for um, the litter size that we, we might be moving towards or the size of the sow? But also, is it future-proof to the consumer? So you have to think about how you might brand a temporary creating option. Um, this, in Sweden, it's a very interesting case study because they started off with temporary creating and then they were, the legislation said no creating at all and they have very high piglet mortality. And um, one of our colleagues there suggests that that's because the pens weren't fit for purpose. If you start with completely loose, then you design it with that in mind. Or are you just looking at performance? And, and this is where it's very difficult to get um, data. There's a real lack of robust scientific data on performance. People are very cagey about giving their results. Academics, we, we have to, so uh, we will. Um, there's mixed reports of temporary crating having higher uh, piglet mortality, but in other countries, there's no significant difference between temporary crating. Switzerland have got a lot of data there, and they see no difference between pens and crates. In the UK, some of our systems can have as low as 6% um, live or mortality. Um, but in Denmark, certainly, they do report 2% difference um, in mortality with the completely loose compared to the farin crate. And in both these studies, they say that litter size is a significant challenge. When you speak to farmers that have taken on this challenge, they talk about the inconsistency. They say, oh, free farring's doing fine. It's 4% higher than crates, but it, it's performing OK. But others say that maybe it runs at 11% uh, live ball mortality, both of them. Very difficult, as I said, to get actual data. But where we have been able to access data, there's a range between 8 to 24% live ball mortality. So you can see there are these inconsistencies. How do we get consistent? I'm definitely not going to do this in two minutes. But uh, uh, we need to optimize pen design, pig selection, and human inputs. This is a talk in itself, so I'm not going to go into it, but all I'd say is we've done a lot of work on this, we know a lot about it, and the design details of your pen matter to performance. When it comes to selecting pigs for free farrowing, I don't think we need to look at a different piglet. Um, we certainly need to just concentrate on improving um, the robustness of piglets in general. But certainly in terms of sows, there are uh, specifics that we could select for, carefulness, but also calmness, not just around the piglets, but also around the human. So you need an appropriate responder, if you like. There is potential for the sow to do the work for you. Um, it's really important that we invest in our, our mothers and they can set the piglets up for life. And if you have the right system, you can optimize performance. Um, but you also need the sow to be in pretty good condition. And I think Natalie's gonna to talk to you a lot more about that. A good stock person is absolutely key. 
There will be an interaction with pen designs. There are certain pen designs where it's very difficult for the stock person to have any effect whatsoever, and certainly in the group system that tends to be the case. There'll be a human-pig um, interaction that's very important, and if anything, staff really do have to be happy. And I think the danger period is the transition period, when you have firing crates on the farm at the same time as alternative systems, because the farm guys and girls need to learn it, but so do the sows. And if you're constantly swapping between the two, we know that this can have, an, uh, can, well, both the animals and the people can learn, but it might take a longer uh, amount of time. What, what will take even longer if you put in the wrong system? That can last a long time, so you really do have to think about that. There will be a steep learning curve. So with four seconds to go, um, this is what I think the future might be. <laughs> I think there will be an increase in loose lactation. The evidence for the benefits of allowing the sows to be loose it, during lactation are indisputable in my mind, so I think that will definitely happen. I think there will be limited increases in full free farrowing, particularly in this country. Why? Because optimization.